Tonight's reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Get yourself up high on a mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily. O Jerusalem, bearer of good news, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his rewards is with him, and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock, and his arm he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Good evening. If you want to have your Bibles open to Isaiah 40, if you don't already, we'll be taking the lesson from there. We'll uh, be looking a little bit closer at the song we just sang. I appreciate our brother Josh Huff leading us in Behold Our God. This is a newer song that we've added, and as I've been trying to do throughout the year, we're going to take a closer look at some of the words to this song and really reflect on why we might especially enjoy singing this song, but why it's so powerful for us to worship God with this song. You know, whether it's a new song or an old song, it's wonderful to enjoy the idea and the feelings that come from singing powerful hymns. But how much more wonderful is it to see that it speaks truth from God's word and that using that through us, we can worship God with that truth to reflect on who he really is, and to see the scriptural inspiration that comes from these words that people have put together. When you consider the song that we just sang, Behold Our God, these are words that are coming almost directly from Isaiah chapter 40. John just read for us there in verses 9 through 11, to behold your God, the one who's coming, the one who's going to be like this shepherd. You go on in Isaiah 40 and you see the first two verses come up as we go on that shows that there is no one, as we sing in the chorus, nothing can compare with God. Verses 12 through 14 in particular hopefully will sound familiar now that we just sang this song. Isaiah 40, 12 through 14 says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? That first verse that we sing, you see reflected in verse 12 here, in the scripture where we're praising God as the creator, the one who holds oceans in his hand, who's numbered every grain of sand. We're praising him because he is the almighty creator. The expanse of creation, just how big it is, and the intricacies of creation to the little grains of sand that just are innumerable to our human minds. God knows each and every one, and he knows the atoms that compose each of those grains of sand. And he's the God of the known universe and the unknown universe beyond what we can even see yet. We praise him. Nothing can compare to him because he is the praiseworthy creator. When we go into verse 2, who's given counsel to the Lord? Who can fathom any of his words? We're praising him as the all-knowing Father. The one who wants to instruct us and guide us. The wisdom and teaching of the all-knowing God cannot be compared to any human counsel or insight that you can find in this world. Past, present, or future. Because all of this comes from the all-knowing God. <laughs> Truly we understand when we reflect on the words of Isaiah 40 as God is speaking through the prophet here. His people needed to understand then, and we as his people need to understand today. <clears throat> Nothing can compare to him. The things that keep you up at night don't compare to God. 
the busyness of your schedule this week and the things you have to do or want to do. They're worthwhile. They're certainly important. But nothing can compare to the one who made you, to the one who loves you, to the one who is watching over you. Our challenge is to make sure that we truly see him that way. You go on in Isaiah 40, picking up in verse 18. God actually asks twice as we go through verse 26 here in this reading, who are you going to try and compare me to? Verse 18 of Isaiah 40, beginning here. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol. A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set it up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Here's the second time the question is asked now in verse 25. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like them, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Anything we try to compare God to is an insult to his true nature. Whether we're setting up a false god in our hearts like they set up the physical idols back in Bible times and sometimes still today. Or whether we're just trying to get a picture of God and we end up putting him in a box instead of truly letting him be God. God asks us the same question that he did in Isaiah's day. Who are you trying to compare him to? It's understandable we want to grasp who God is, but we cannot limit him in that endeavor. He alone is is worthy of our adoration. That's the refrain of this song that we sing. Come, let us adore him. What does it mean to adore something? You might think of a baby. Certainly we talk about deep love for something that is adorable. But it also implies in the use of that word, deep respect. And so both must be present when we talk about adoring the God of of the universe. We adore the king because he is beyond comparing to anything or anyone else. He deserves our deepest love and our deepest respect. Behold our God. The reality is everyone has the opportunity to behold these things. Just as God spoke to Isaiah, Paul makes it clear in the letter to the Romans in chapter 1 that anyone can look around and begin the journey of beholding God. Not that they would physically see God himself, but they would see enough to know that he is the almighty maker. That they would begin pursuing him and seeking him out because nature, creation, existence itself, points our eyes upward, if you will. Romans chapter 1, 19 through 20, God's Spirit says it this way through the pen of Paul. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. If we're not going to see God in the majesty and beauty of the things that have been made, it's because we're choosing not to see it, not to seek it. And so God says here in his word, if you're going down that path, you have no 
excuse. You're willingly turning away from that option, the truth, and embracing a lie. That's what the chapter goes on here to say, that you have to exchange the truth for a lie, to not see God's fingerprints, to not have your eyes drawn upward, spiritually speaking, to realize nothing can compare to our almighty God. Back in Isaiah, this time in chapter 53, you know, where John read for us in chapter 40, it spoke there of the good news that was being preached to God's people. And so let's talk about what this good news means and how it's reflected in the third verse of the hymn, Behold Our God. (coughs) Who has felt the nails upon his hands? Our minds are meant to go back to the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And the words that come from that make us reflect on what Isaiah says later on in his writing here in chapter 53. That Jesus suffered and died to take away our sins. Verses 4 through 6 of Isaiah 53 say this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. Pick up in verse 10 with me now. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You see that word coming up regularly in Isaiah 53, that Jesus was bearing the iniquity, the transgressions, these things. It's important to note here, and this is an important theological point. Jesus, as Ben said at the Lord's Supper table this morning, was not guilty of sin. He didn't take on our guiltiness for us. Rather, he, through what he did, is saying, yes, every single one of God's children, every soul that he's ever made is guilty. And I'm going to pay for it. That punishment will be on me, says Jesus. For our guilt, he took on the punishment due to us So that the wages of our sin, what we earn by rebelling against God, death, eternal separation from God, the death, that life is paid by Jesus. He paid a debt we could never pay because he was sinless. He was the only one who could make us right with God. He himself being God. Bearing all the guilt of sinful man, when I sing this song, I think of 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, which summarizes some of the ideas here from Isaiah 53. 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 21. For our sake, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus the Son, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't misunderstand this verse. It's not saying that Jesus became sinful when he was on the cross. He was taking our penalty 
He was putting himself between us and the justice, the wrath of God. He took the stroke that was due you and me so that when we put our faith in Jesus, we might become, as it says here, the righteousness of God. Not that we are literally his righteousness, but that we can be made right with God because that penalty has been paid for. In the suffering sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God accomplishes God's plan from the beginning, and he is glorified in victory. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wrestle with songs that we sing because there's lines like these that I have to think about and reflect on, and we have to understand that we want to sing things that are truthful and really grasp why they're so beautiful, and hopefully that's because they are true. Humbled to the grave, God eternal, humbled to the grave. When I first heard this song, I heard this line and thought how we would normally use the phrase, you humble somebody. It's being done to you. God eternal was humbled to the grave. Well, we just saw from Isaiah 40, nobody is above God. How could somebody humble him? Therein lies the beauty of what we're singing about and what we read about in Philippians chapter 2. So we go on, Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Both of these ideas you'll find in the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes to the church here, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God eternal was humbled to the grave in the person of Jesus Christ because he humbled himself. He laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. The demonstration of the awesome love of our God and his purposes toward us in Jesus. He not only let Jesus die for our sake, but he also raised him so that you and I could have a hope not just for this life, but for an eternal life, a resurrected life with God in heaven. The language here, the bowing and confessing Jesus was raised and made highly exalted and in verse 10, you see at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. These words, too, come from Isaiah, back in Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. You see them there this way. God speaking, of course. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. It's accomplished in Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection, how he reigns as king today. The only question that remains is, you hear this good news, are you going to obey the good news? Are you going to bow your knee? Are you going to confess that Jesus is Lord? Because the reality of what Philippians and Isaiah says is that every single soul will do this. For many, it will be on the very last day, the day of eternity, when Jesus appears a second time. And they will bow and confess, but it will be too late because they did not live their lives bowing and confessing. You and I have the opportunity today, right now, this week, the rest of this year, into the rest of our lives, to choose to see him as king, 
the highly exalted one that he is, who died for you and for me to show him that adoration that he so much deserves from each and every one of us. The kingship of Christ is central to this song. The idea that when we get to this beautiful part of the song, when the men and the women are breaking out and singing in different parts, you will reign forever talking about authority that never transfers or ends because it is beyond the scope of time. You will reign forever. And then the lady singing, let your glory fill the earth. Now it's beyond the scope of space. There is no jurisdiction or country or place in the world, in the universe, in your life that is not under the dominion of Jesus Christ. You are accountable to him for how you live in every single part of your life. Every soul on every continent and any crevice and crack of this planet is accountable to his or her maker. This is the kingship of Christ. His domain is seen both through time and space. And how his people choose to live. How we're adoring him, not just on a Sunday when we can come together and sing beautiful songs. He's certainly glorified in that. What about Monday morning? What about Monday afternoon? Monday night when you get home? Do we adore him with every moment we have? Reflecting on the truth that nothing can compare to God and that he has redeemed me. He's paid the price that I owed for my sin. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes some beautiful words inspired by God's spirit himself. As he's encouraging Timothy and by extension as he encourages us as we read this letter. To see Jesus in the position of his kingship. 1 Timothy 6, 13 through 16. Paul writes to Timothy here and says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. You see here, Paul doing his best and what God has revealed to paint a picture of why Jesus is the ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, why he holds all authority and we need to submit to him with our whole heart. It mentions that good confession there. He is confessed to be king before Pontius Pilate. If you remember in John 18, 36 through 37, Pilate straight up asks him, so are you a king? And Jesus says, you say I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Yeah, I've come for the truth, Jesus says. And if you remember, that's when Pilate says, what is truth? But this is the confession that it's referring to here in 1 Timothy 6. It's Jesus making the same proclamation that God, the Father, does. Jesus is the reigning king. He is the king of the church. He is the king of the whole world. All are accountable to him. We get to choose whether we will bow and confess. And the beautiful thing is, Jesus did not die for you because you bowed and confessed. He died so you could bow and confess. While you and I were still enemies, he paid that price. So that we could have this awesome opportunity to be in relationship with God. To walk with him. To lean on him every step of the way. And to do as Paul is telling Timothy to do here. To keep his commandments, his teachings, to keep them unstained with a pure heart and a pure motive. 
and that we would be free from reproach. What does that mean in summary? We have got to live like he's actually our king. When we wake up in the morning, when we're interacting with the people who we live with in our homes, when we go out and we're working shoulder to shoulder to the people in our workplaces, when we look across the street or our lawns and see the people that live in our general vicinities, we need to live like Jesus is king in the way that we think about those situations, in the way that we speak to those people and about those people, and what we do with the time and opportunity that's given to us. We demonstrate adoration, deep love, and deep respect for King Jesus with how we worship him on a Sunday, in how we use our time and our money, in how we treat other people. We glorify him when we do things the way that he calls us to. Why? Because he's the king over it all. Nothing is outside his view of dominion. He holds us accountable. And he wants us to experience his goodness, the peace, the joy, the love that comes from being right with this King of kings and Lord of lords. He dwells in unapproachable light, but he invites us to approach him, which is a thought I want you to carry into this week. We do not deserve to be in the presence of this king, but he wants us to come into his presence. He wants us to live with him now as we walk through this life. And he wants to bring us into his kingdom, into the eternal kingdom, true kingdom of heaven when this life is over. The all-powerful, all-knowing God loves you so much that the Son humbled himself to die for you. I didn't deserve that. You didn't deserve that. That's how much God loves you. That's how much value God places on you and your eternal soul. Will you live for him this week? Will you speak and act like Jesus is king every moment? He gives you hope for today and hope for tomorrow and the perfect hope for an eternity spent with him. But in order to do that, you must be added to his kingdom to be able to say, behold our God in this life, to truly revere him and respect him and love him and serve him. So that you can say, behold our God, when we do see him face to face on that last day. Submit to his will and put your trust in him. You can make a good confession tonight by saying Jesus is the son of God. By turning away from sin that has broken our relationship with him and to turn back to him. To be right with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. That you would claim that precious and awesome gift. That you would acknowledge and accept that Jesus took the punishment and bore your sins to the cross by being buried with him in baptism so that your sins can be washed away. This is how you obey the good news. If you have not obeyed the good news tonight, please ask your questions. Talk to us. We want everyone here to be right with our maker so we can all help each other on our journey to heaven there's anything that we can do for you tonight, we're going to sing this song, Bring Christ Your Broken Life. We encourage you to do that this very evening. If there's anything at all of a spiritual nature we can help you with, why don't you make it known?